الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عكيبة للمتقين ولا عدوان عدوان على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم أجمعين أما بعد اللهم انفعني بما علمت وعلمني بما ينفعني ورزقني علما ينفعني السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بإذن الله تعالى just briefly إن شاء الله تعالى we discuss finding a sweet spot between دين and دون finding that sweet spot all right and what do we mean by a sweet spot between deen and dunya no doubt the muslim especially the sunni the one who is instructed to follow that of the ministry of the prophet وسلم, is to be balanced throughout his or her life and allah Jalla has <coughs> instructed us on being balanced as well as the prophet وسلم, has instructed us in the authentic sunnah on being balanced. So being balanced is something that we should, you know, strive for and it's something that we actually have been instructed to do. So we want to be balanced throughout our, all of our lives. Therefore, we do not be too far to the left or too far to the right um, that we be balanced. So when I say finding that sweet spot, we mean in finding that balance between deen and dunya. All right. How do you find that balance? Allah Jalla wa Ala He tells us in His book. He says, "Rabbana atina fi dunya hasina, wa fi al akhirati hasina, wa kina adab al nar." In Surah Al Baqarah, Allah Jalla wa Ala instructs us of a du'a, and before mentioning this du'a, Allah Jalla wa Ala mentioned that there were those who make du'a, but only for the dunya. And they have no share whatsoever in the Akira. And this is because these people have deprived themselves of that balance. And they only prefer what was in front of them as opposed to preferring both things. Okay? So Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says, Our Lord, those who say, Our Lord, grant us the good in this life and the next life and protect us from the fire. And protect us from the torment of the fire. Alright, so we see that the believers are those who make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them both good from the dunya as well as in the akira. So deen in dunya is something that the believers should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the higher of both. And that they should have a balance between them two. And how do you find that balance? Shaykh Taymin, rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, he mentioned a beautiful point, all right, where he says that, he mentions that, كُلَّمَا سَمَحْتَ لَكَ الْفَرْسَ لِنَشْرَ السُنَّةِ فَانْشُرُهَا يَكُنْ لَكَ أَجْرُهَا وَأَجْرَ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا إِلَى يَوْمِ كِيَامِ and this is taken from his explanation to Riyal Salihin. The Shaykh, he says, whenever you find the opportunity, or whenever it's presented to you the opportunity to spread the sunnah, all right? To teach it, to instruct others with it, to implement it, to act on it. <clears throat> but whenever it is an opportunity for you to spread the sunnah, then you should spread it for it to be a reward for you and whosoever act on it until when? Until Ilai Yom Qiyamah, until the day of Qiyamah. All right, to the day of resurrection. And the point of me bringing the statement of Shaykh Thameen in the beginning of this talk is only to point out something to you guys is iktanam furasa, taking advantage of opportunities, all right? And not every opportunity is a good opportunity, but those opportunities which are good you should be taking advantage of those opportunities, those fursa, fursa to zahibiyya, or as you want to say, those golden opportunities that comes your way, you should 
one to take on those opportunities. But how do you know which one is good and which one is not? You're going to get that, inshallah ta'ala, from your spirituality, from your deen, your creed. All of that is going to prepare you for what is harmful and what is not, what is, I mean, what is beneficial and what is not, and what is harmful. That's what's going to prepare you. So finding that sweet spot between your deen and dunya is going to rely basically on you balancing between two things, your spirituality, right? And your dunya. And when I say about your dunya, I'm meaning specifically you living in this world and things that you need to, you know, to get along, to get ahead, to survive in this particular world, such as finance, all right? So finding that sweet spot between your spirituality, your finance, your, you know, your living, all of these different things as far as you're eating, you're drinking, and so forth, you're going to have to rely heavy on the bedrock principles of your faith in order to guide you on how to carry out those other aspects in our lives while we live in this dunya. And interestingly enough, if you look at most of the ahadith books, all of the books that you look at, any ahadith book, if you look at the subject matter, look at the chapters, the upper webs, and how they start from here and how they end up here. Notice that they deal with Iman, they deal with Ilm, Faith, all of that stuff first, your foundational part, before getting into the Ahkam, such as Salat, which will come next, or the, you know, the Masajid, where the places of the Salat is performed at for the men, um, and all of those different things going on down uh, to the fasting, to the Zakat, to the Hajj, Etc. Right to jihad, etc. 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 Right, even to the point of kitabul buyur, business transactions. All we on down to multiple different things, oaths, agreements, and so forth. And if you see how the scholars of hadith set up those books, notice how there is a balance there because it talks about what it talks about our spirituality, and it also talks about the things that we have to do in the dunya. All right, those guidelines we need to do in the dunya. So that's why it should be a balance between the two. Unfortunately, you find people being this way. You'll find an individual who go headlong in the dunya, but is very weak in terms of religiosity, in terms of their deen. They're weak in far as, far as their ilm, as far as tatbik of that ilm, as far as knowledge, as far as the implementation of that knowledge, as far as the seeking and acquiring of that knowledge. But you find them very well off when it comes to financial uh, um, financial situations or coming to uh, education, whether it's secular education, all these different things. You find them real strong in that area, but very weak in the dean. And then you get the opposite. You find individuals who are poor, right? And they're so focused on being, you know, uh, their religiosity. They're super strong as far as their dean and so forth, but they're very poor when it comes to engaging and dealing in the dunya and getting by and so forth, right? They don't have a balance between the two. And the Sahabas with one Allah Ta'ala alayhim were not like this. There was a balance that was set between there. So you don't have to be poor to be strong religiously. And you don't have to be, I mean, you don't have to be religious and meaning that you're poor, all right? And you don't have to be rich and ignorant of your deen. You can be both knowledgeable of your deen, implementing in your deen, as well as um, being well off. So that's what we want to mean. Finding that sweet spot. How do we find that sweet spot? By balancing between the two. And the companions did an excellent job in doing that. Because they realized that in order for them to in order for them to get ahead in the dunya, is that they have to first do the first main thing. They had to submit the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to be the most important thing in their heart. That was important more than anything else. That's important. They had to have that in their heart because once their heart was attached to the Creator and their heart was attached to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it made it easy for them to block out having any love and attachment towards whatever is material in this dunya that is perishable by nature, that will not remain forever. 
And that way they were able to have a balance. So if Allah blessed them to be fortunate enough to come across a lot of wealth or to have a lot of things, they were not thrown off, so to speak, of their deen because they did not have a passionate love or a love for that particular thing more than they had that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And this is important to understand these key points, right? Because to get ahead financially, all right, especially in today's society where whether you're in the Eastern world or whether you're in the Western world, they had made Reba a part of their institution. Whether you agree with it or not, whether you accept it or not, they have made Reba a part of their institution in dealing with finance. Likewise, they have made the credit score a major component in dealing with getting ahead. Whether you want to get a house, whether you want to get a car, whether you want to get anywhere, someone is going to look at your credit report. Do you understand? How worthy are you? How re you know I mean how you know how how can someone say that you are stand up because you have a record showing that you are noteworthy because you pay back your debts because you're a person who pay your debts on time or you're a person who X Y and Z so they keep this credit score on you and they have made it a part of your life so you have to realize this is a reality that all of us have to deal with whether we believe in the law or not this is the world that they have made so how do we find that sweet spot? So, again now, we can't deal with Reba because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us with it. But what happened in the case when we have no choice but to be involved in a system that is steeped within Reba? Right? Right? So then we recognize the statement of Allah Jalla wa ala, where he mentions in Surah Tabakura and many other places in the Quran where Allah talks about the ruling of eating swine. All right? Except for those who are not bagged, who doesn't do it, you know what I mean? Uh, they do not do it willfully or they have not, you know, they have not done it willfully or transgressing against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and partaking in the swine, right? Even though it's haram. But the ulama, they, they say that if a person was having to eat swine, he had nothing else to eat but that swine, then he's only allowed to partake from the swine enough that would suffice him. One, without believing that that swine is permissible for them. Two, also understanding that the swine was haram and that it's still wrong. But because of the necessity, the dire necessity of the situation, and because of the necessity of the situation, they're allowed to partake only without overindulging. Right? Now, why is I'm bringing that up? Because when you look at banks, where a lot of us keep our money at in banks, a lot of us don't keep our money under our mattress or in our homes. We keep our money in banks. We deal with financial institutes, which deals with Reba. All right? And when you look at these circumstances, then you look at it from that standpoint, that ruling, that I'm only going to partake in this Reba out of a necessity because the way that the banks are set up, the way that the world is working, only, but I will not overindulge it. I will not overindulge it, and nor would I ever believe that it's permissible. I will always believe that it's haram, something that my Lord Supreme has prohibited, and I understand that. So when you have that balance, because that becomes a balance for you, you don't overindulge, all right? You don't overindulge. So you have to have that balance in between. I want to share something with you guys, a hadith from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that deals with the dunya we, part of, you know, that deals with the dunya, right? And we're talking about balance between deen and dunya, all right? Notice what the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is going to say in this hadith, and we're going to just do the fawa'id, because I can't go too long, we know Salat Zen. Um, this hadith is narrated on the authority of Rifa'a, the companion Rifa'a Tibni Rafi'a. All right, Rifa'a Ibn Rafi'a, Radi Allah Taala and him, and who may Allah be pleased with him. He said that and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's telling us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked su'ila. He was asked the question. The question was presented to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I you kiss. And this is beautiful here. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Wasallam was asked, which earning is the best? Earning the livelihood. 
which profession, which thing that we can do to earn a livelihood that is best. Call the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam respond by saying, Amalu Rajuli bi yadihi. Amalu Rajuli bi yadihi. A man working with his own hands. All right? A man working with his own hands is the best way to earn. This is what the Prophet is saying. This is the, the answer that he's giving to this particular question. Wakullu, the Prophet doesn't stop. He says, Wakullu bay'in mabru. In every successful transaction, we're going to talk about what is a successful transaction, what is a successful uh, profession, what is a successful trade. We're going to talk about that so you can understand why he mentioned bay'in mabru. All right, why did the Prophet mention? Also, I want you to see how the deen is connected with this hadith in itself. All right, so now, even though the Prophet was asked about a dunya we subject matter, he still incorporated a deen aspect to it, right? And you might say, well, Where's the deen aspect to it in this particular hadith? The deen aspect. To it in this particular hadith is that the Prophet وسلم, he says, So the Prophet وسلم, is mentioning that the transaction, the trade, the profession, the work that a person does have to be free of certain things in order for it to be successful. And those things are things which are intangible. And things which are tangible But those things which are intangible Are such as It had to be void of deception hmm. Right It can't be no leash Alright It can't be no trickery It can't be no uh, um, uh, Lying It can't be no kedab Alright There cannot be no false pretense Within that trade or that profession I have to be void of those things and I have to have certain things connected with it in order to be free. So again, game wise, if you know that your Lord is watching you and that you have to obey him and you know you have to be an upright individual, then when you conduct a business transaction or when you conduct your, 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 your trade or your profession, you have to do it with truthfulness. All right. And it have to be clear. Whereas there's no ambi ambiguity, you know what I'm saying, but, 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 right? There is nothing in it that's confusing that causes the person that you're doing the job for or causing the person that you're selling to or causing the person that you're having the transaction with to doubt or feel that they're being slighted in the least when dealing with this issue. So you have to be upright within yourself. So that's Dean. And then he's still talking about dunya. So you see how it still connects. All right. It still connects. There is a sweet spot between Dean and dunya, brothers and sisters. It still connects. Look what Sheikh Uthameen says about this hadith. Uh, that that the, the, the Sheikh brings, alhamdulillah, for us to understand. Because the hadith does mention a man. Amalu Rajan. What a man works with his own hand. Sheikh Uthameen says that the woman is included in this part of the hadith. Why? Because the origin is that whatever has been established during the right of the man is also established during the right of the woman, okay? And what, whatever has been established on the right of the woman is also established for the right of the man unless there is something that specifies with evidence that it is for this specific gender. So if the Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith or if the ayah specifically says this is for the woman, right? Then in that case, it has specified the woman and then the men is excluded. Or if it says that this is for the men and it has, you know, specified the men and then that means the woman is excluded. But if we don't have any of that there, then it is to be general. It applies both the men and women. So just because the Prophet ﷺ said that, Amalu mara'a biyadiha, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that, you know, working with a woman working by her own hands, she's included in this hadith. I wanted to mention that point here because mean brings out. And then I want to mention the point that we're talking about. So the Shagat Amin, he brings a beautiful point here. He says, He says that this part of the hadith is explained by the Sunnah itself. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah said, 
وبينا بورك لهما في بيعهما فبيع مبرور meaning that if they are truthful and it is clear meaning both between the person who's doing the transaction who's conducting the transaction and the one who's if both parties are truthful right and they are clear right then it would be blessing placed in it for both of them within the cell okay within the transaction there would be a blessing for both of them this hadith is collected by bukhari in the book of transactions right business transactions also the sheikh what they mean says for bayar mabrur makana mabniyan al he says bayar mabrur is whatever is built upon or constructed upon truthfulness and clarity it have to be truthfulness in its description and clarity within itself right that you know that this is the actual thing that's done he says for example la yaqulu hadha tayyib wa huwa radi'un for example the person doesn't say that this is good right but in actuality is not good like if a person was selling fruit for example he tells you that the fruit is good right he tried to hide the bad ones under underneath so you don't see the bad ones right but he tried to tell you the fruit is good or something like that right but it's not and he's lying just to try to get the money out of you and so forth this is not being truthful so it had to be based upon truthfulness within its description and clarity upon in and of itself and the reality of it and then the sheikh adds a third thing and he says we add a third thing a part of these conditions for bayat mabrur for a successful transaction is it have to agree with the legislation of Allah meaning the sharia wa faqa sharia fa in qala fa sharia wa in kana mabni ala sidq wa bayan fa laysa bi mabrur because if it's the case that sheikh sheikh means saying if it's the case that it is not in agreement with the Quran and the Sunnah, with the legislation of Allah Azza wa Jalla. It doesn't matter if it was truthful in its description and clear in reality of in and of itself, because it went against what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has legislated anyway, and so therefore it can't be accepted. So it can, therefore it won't be a successful transaction in and of itself, right? And you might say, well, why is I'm talking about all of this when I'm talking about finding that sweet spot between Deen and Dunya? Because again. My intent for all of this is that we have to find that sweet spot between our spirituality and our finance, our spirituality and our living, our spirituality and our buying, I mean, our eating and our drinking and our going about our daily routine within this dunya. We have to find that sweet spot in between the two. Sheikh of mean he brings some beautiful fawaid that I hope that we can benefit from. The first fawaid that he brings, and I think this is hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the benefit from this, is that. It shows the keenness, the, um, the diligence of the companions themselves with Allah Ta'ala alayhim, anhum, right? And the fact that they ask about afdalu um, a'mal, they ask about the best of actions. And they didn't do it haphazardly. It wasn't, as he's going to explain, he's about to explain. They didn't do it just to ask the Prophet Sallallahu about these things without any intention to carry it out. All right, so the Sheikh he says here, this is due to the fact that it mentions Su'ila, he was asked which earning is the best. The companions, when they ask, they ask about a perfection or something, they did not intend merely just for the knowledge of it, rather, they intended to act upon it, they intend to comply to it and act upon it. It's not like many of the people today, they might ask about the best of this or the best of this action. But they don't act on it, nor have any intention to act on it. Like in whom Allah he says, however, may Allah be pleased with them. They did not act except for the purpose of acting off it. And this is the quality of the believer. He said, and these are the believers. This is their trait and their quality. All right. They learn so that they can implement, not learn so they can just gather the information without any intent of carrying it out. Aladina ida Ali Muhaq, those who learn the truth. Amalubi, and then they act according to it. Amma an yaalamuhu, yaalimuhu, wa yajaluhu fi sudurihim ka nuskim al kutub. That is the jawat al sudur. For hada leesa min kisala mu'mini. He says, as for those individuals who learn the thing, and then they place that thing within their breast, right? And it's like it's firmly rooted, like 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 something that is firmly inside a book, right? They know it well. They got the thing right in their breast. He says, but however, it does not escape their, it does not escape their chest. In other words, it don't go nowhere. It just stay there, right? They don't have no intentions on acting on it. That's basically what he's saying. They don't act on it. He says, and then this cannot be considered from the qualities of the believer. This is not their descriptions. For the believer is the one who is mutaharrik, constantly moving. Meaning what? 
He is one who does the action and he doesn't, I mean, he's he's the one who act and doesn't delay it. He's the one who act and doesn't delay it. That's what he's saying, right? And I think that's beautiful that the Sheikh worth this benefit out here, showing you that the companions did not merely ask questions just to ask them, but they have all intent to act off of it, as we see right there, right? He brings something else, mucks up. Tell you what's up, I'm gonna be other here. Another benefit he brings is that the makasib, the way that we earn stuff in this world, uh, differs, right? There is those things that we can earn that is wholesome and good, right? It benefit us both in this life and the next. So when we look at something being wholesome, it have to benefit us in both, all right? If something just benefit us in the dunya, then it have to be free of certain things so that it can be under the mubah, the, permiss the permissible things that we can take, and it does not go against the sharia. But if it's something, right, that we want the maximum benefit from, then we want to make sure that whatever it is, it benefits us both in this life and the next. And then something can be filthy, where it doesn't benefit us whatsoever if we intake, if we engage in it or we partake in it whatsoever. And then something can even be better, more wholesome, right? Up, oh, yeah, higher than that, right? More wholesome. So he says, with it, and he says the evidence of this, evidence of this is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was asked, which earning is the best, right? Which lets you know that there were levels to this, all right? There was levels to this. He says, so he confirmed them by giving us the best way that you can earn something. And that's by working with your hands, all right? That's by working with your hands, whether you in agriculture, whether you're a carpenter, whether whatever you do that you produce by the way of you working with your hands, right? It's the best way to earn, is what the Prophet Sallallahu is pointing out. And that deals with our deen. I mean, that deals with our dunya, right? That deals with our dunya. Then he brings another benefit. He says that the Prophet Sallallahu was given comprehensive speech, laconic speech, what they call comprehensive, Joanne McKellar. And, and he was also given these words which were short, but they contain vast meanings. As we see, this hadith is real short. It's pretty much like three statements. It's real short, but look how beneficial it can be for everyone. That's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with. All right? And then Sheikh Uthameen, he mentioned about again, we we'll talk on that issue again, about the bay'ah being mabrur, right? Meaning that the transaction being good, okay? All right, then he mentions the fourth benefit is that the transaction, minha bay'ah marur, that from transaction, it can fall into two. They can be those which will be successful and those which will be unsuccessful. All right, they can be successful and those which are unsuccessful. So that sweet spot is important. We need to know how to manage our deen just like we need to learn how to manage our dunya. All right. If you find yourself being strong in your dunya but lacking in your deen, then there is a deficiency and you have to immediately address that issue, inshallah. If Allah make you aware of that thing, and you actually can recognize that you are making a grave mistake if you find yourself being exceedingly well within your dunya and not in your deen. So you want to manage your deen and you want to manage your dunya. And you're going to be like this until you meet a law. All right? You're going to be like this till you meet a law. The deen have to lead the dunya and the dunya have to follow the deen. No way do the dunya leads the deen, and no way do the deen follow the dunya. It has to be the other way around. But you can do this, and I'm going to give you something nice before I close up. You can do this because Ibn Qayyim al Juziyya, rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, he mentions about the different ahadiths of the Prophet that tells us that the actions are recorded to Allah Jalla wa ala, and reported, you know, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on three different occasions. So he tells us that the, and he, and he brings the proof for each one. He tells us that the actions are brought to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, by every fajr and also, right? It is brought up to Allah, it descends to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? From the angels, right? And that's a deli. That's actions on a deli basis. Then he talks about our actions 
being um, our actions being on a weekly basis. All right. When we talk about those from Drew Maha to Drew Maha and so forth and so on, that their deeds is on a weekly basis. And then he talks about those narrations where it talks about the deeds on a yearly basis. Right. And he mentions the statement of Umar ibn Khattab, the famous statement that we all heard before is Hasibu and Fusakum, take account of yourselves, right? Habla to Hasibu and right to you are taken to account, to you are brought into account, take account of yourselves. So this is a inventory, so to speak, that we must do. We must take inventory of our actions. This is our deen. We must take inventory of our spirituality. This is our deen. So that way we manage our deen, but then we also must take inventory of our finance. That way we manage our dunya. Do you see what I'm saying? So we manage our deen by taking inventory, and we manage our finances or our dunya by taking inventory. Do you understand? So you have to be able to balance and find that sweet spot between the two. Manage yourself by taking it. How do you manage your finance? We all should know this. We budget, right? How do we budget? By getting to write out what? Our expenses, and, you know, overhead and all of that. And then looking at, you know, our income. And what is our income? And then we win, they tell us, if our income exceeds our expenses. We lose if our expenses exceeds our income. But how do you manage your deed? Where do you begin at? Now you take that inventory like he's saying. You be mindful of those ahadiths that tell you that your deed is going to be presented between Fajr and also. So that means you're going to do those deeds which you want to be presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a daily basis. You're going to be mindful of the, the weekly and in, in, in the daily. And you're going to try to do those deeds which is going to get you presented in a good light with Allah Jalla wa ala. So you're going to manage those deeds by beginning to do that. You have to take inventory of yourself, right? Every also time you should be thinking back, okay, what did I do to what did I do before also? Meaning all of that time before also, what did I do to get closer to Allah? What did I do that I need improvement with? All of these different things you need to do. So you have a job to do. Just like you have a job to do with your finance. The problem is, brothers and sisters, we don't have a balance. And because we don't have a balance, it shows. And we lack out on multiple different things that harms us more so than benefit us. Right, and you find individuals like that. So you want to find, and then you look in the Quran. Get ready to finish. You look in the Quran, and the law talks about these types of people. You look at the people who brags about the different stuff that they was blessed with in the dunya, and they looked that they are fortunate so much so. And sort of calf, the individual thought that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would not punish him. He, why? Because he was under the impression that if I got this here in the dunya, and my Lord gave me this in the dunya, that means my Lord is going to give me better in the in the act in the akhirah. Right? This is what he was arguing with With the believer right? And this is why he denied resurrection And so forth You have to pay attention to this stuff When you look at those conversations in the Quran And you look at those debates and those stories that's being told This is the difference between people Who prefer one over the other All right, The Akira is better than the dunya But the believer takes the good of both The dunya and the deen I mean the dunya and, and the Akira right? Whereas the non-believer don't believe in their Akira, right? So they reject that, and the only thing they live for is what is in the dunya, the present, right? So they are neglected from the Akira, all right? From whatever is benefited for that. We can't afford that, all right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to get better with our deen and to strengthen our iman every day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to get better with our finances. Stop taking your finances in a, uh, uh, in a manner. There has been inflation. Uh, in every century, all right? We have many statements from many of the scholars of the past who have dealt with economical crisis during their time, right? There has been situations where we didn't. A lot of that stuff, there is debt. A part of managing finances is man managing debt. You can't overlook your debt, all right? The Prophet ﷺ died having debt, but still there is something that has been done to what? Ward and pay off his debt. This is why in the laws of inheritance, a part of your inheritance, before they even get distributed, is that they have to pay off whatever you left, have to go towards paying off your debts. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned an authenticated hadith that an individual can be held up at the gate because of his debts. You understand? Until so his debts have to be paid off. So it's important that we understand all of these things. 
we accumulate stuff, we acquire stuff, and we give it no second thoughts. And we can't afford to be that way. We are in a situation we are in because we don't take advantage of what we're supposed to take advantage of. Manage your finance so you can get yourself in a situation in a better position where you don't have to walk around in survival mode, which is depressive, brothers and sisters. It's a depression that is very depressive if you have to live in a survival mode. Oh, I got to, you know, everything is seen like the shoe is getting ready to drop. I'm getting ready to leave my house or I'm getting ready to lose my, my car or I'm getting ready to lose this. Or I don't have enough for this. So this bill is this. That's depressing. It's, it's, it's anxiety building up. It's fear and it's all this stuff is built on you every day. You're just working and working and working, right? And you don't get none of that. You have to manage it. You have to think. If the law gave you intelligence, it gave you an akal, it gave you a call. But you have to think, okay, this ain't going to cut it. My income is this much. So if I am got to go get a trade, if I got to go learn something, or if I got to go get a better job that gives me more income that comes in the house that allow me to overcome my overhead, then I have to do that. If I can write out whatever my expenses are and see what is unnecessary to do away with, I do away with subscriptions I don't need, things that I don't do, I get rid of those things. This is a reality. We have to do that. The one who is best at doing that, they call him husn to sarf. That's the person who have good managing skills, all right? Sometimes the woman can be better than the men in this, and sometimes the man can be better than the woman. But guess what? The scholars, in, when they talk about in marriage, for a wakil, <laughs> one of the conditions they mention, especially in the um, Ahmed Madhab, is that the person for him to be a wakil is that he have to have husn to sarf. That he should be someone who's good to manage affairs. Right? Someone who know how to distribute and manage affairs because he's talking about delegating the affairs of a man and a woman. He's going to pass this woman off to this man. He needs to be able to know how to delegate that. So this is why it's important that we learn this. Whatever we said that was incorrect in our translation was from ourselves. And she time whatever was correct from Allah who Jalla wa ala subhanaka Allah humbi hamdi ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik jazakallahu khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa